Hi, I'm Simon Stones, Patient Advocate and Consultant, and in today's webinar, I'm going to be talking to you about designing and presenting a poster. This webinar is based on a workshop that I delivered at the 22nd European Annual Conference of People with Arthritis and Rheumatism in Europe. In this webinar, we will be covering what makes a good poster, tools to develop a poster, and about promoting and presenting a poster. And it's important for us to remember that, although there are many experts regarded in designing and presenting posters, even perfection has room for improvement. So let's look at what actually is a poster. And really, a poster is just a visual abstract of your research, of your project, your organisation or an initiative that you are involved in. It's important to remember that a poster is not a bottomless pit where you dump everything you want to know about a given topic or piece of work. Posters are increasingly used in a variety of different settings. And with this comes advantages and disadvantages. Some advantages of posters means that they enable a two-way dialogue about a particular topic. They are great for networking, and this is why you see so many different posters at conferences. Posters are also a visual communication, and historically were used for print purposes, but are increasingly being used within the digital world. However, there are some disadvantages regarding posters. They can be time intensive to design and can be expensive to print if you don't know the right places to go. Sometimes, particularly within the academic world, poster presentations can be seen as less formal or professional compared to oral presentations. And they can be difficult to transport, but there are increasing numbers of options to enable that transportation of posters to be much more easier. And we'll touch on that later on. So let's begin and let's look at this four stage process of designing and presenting your poster. And we're going to look through setup and sizing, the core ingredients of the poster, the design element, and then about reviewing and next steps. So let's begin with setup and sizing. Let's begin at the start with the poster size. And so it's really important that if you are designing a poster for an event, such as a conference, that you check for available presenter guidelines. Now, conference organisers these days usually send this out well in advance of abstracts being submitted and in the preparation of posters. So it's really important to look at those and review them early on. Sometimes organisers will give you the poster hanging board size, and so it's important not to confuse this with the actual size of the poster. Now typically, the average conference poster is A0 or A1. And sometimes the orientation can be in portrait or it can be in landscape. But it's so important to get this right before you get your poster printed. We don't want any mistakes on the day. It's also really useful to begin with an existing template. Now this could be one that you get from your colleague, downloaded from the internet, or it could be one of your own templates that you create and then you can use time and time again. But in doing so, it's really important that you get the document size correct from the outset. So setting up posters in A4, normal paper size, can be an issue, as when we print on A0, the result will be that the document will look pixelated. It will be a poor resolution because we are stretching the poster from A4 to A0. And this can be resolved very easily by, in your template, going to page setup and making sure that the dimensions of the document template is of the poster size that you want to print. So, for example, if it's the A0, then you would set the size to A0. Sometimes there are options for this. But more often than not, you will have to input in the actual measurements of A0 paper size, which is 841 by 1189 millimetres. 
The next step is the core ingredients, and we must begin by knowing your audience. Pitching your poster to the right audience is so important, whether that be people living with health conditions and their carers, academics, healthcare professionals, policy makers, or indeed multiple audiences. Each of those groups of stakeholders may require different messaging and different information. Moving on as part of core ingredients, we need to think about the contents. Now I often use a scientific model to help structure my thinking when I am presenting the poster. And so it's always key to start with a good, clear title. You then need to list your authors and indeed any affiliations. Now that could be to an organisation, it could be an affiliation to a research group, or indeed a university. I then structure the flow of the poster using the scientific model, which has validity. Here I list the introduction, the aims and objectives, materials and methods, results, conclusions and acknowledgements. Now this may seem formal, but let's look at this a little deeper. The introduction. It's essentially the background, setting the scene. What's the issue that you are dealing with? What is that unmet need? Why do you need to do this piece of work? And that leads really nicely onto the aims and objectives. What you intended to do, what you set out to do and achieve. The materials and methods, you can think of this as listing how you did what you did, whether it was an event, project, whatever it may be, you are setting out, so you're making it clear for your reader or your audience how you did what you did. The results then naturally followed. What did you find when you did your project? What were the messages that you identified from what you did? And that leads on really nicely to the conclusion. The key take home messages from your poster. When people walk away from your poster, what do you want them to remember? And that is what should be in your conclusion. And the acknowledgement section often gets forgotten, but is really important. It's good to acknowledge the people who have helped to shape the project, who have taken part, advised, and so on. At this point now where we're beginning to formulate the contents of our poster, I often advise to storyboard. Now this is a technique used commonly by different people to visualise the contents of the poster. Particularly during your early days of developing posters, it's good to start off with pen and paper. And this doesn't have to be anything complicated, though I have developed a template which you can download from my website. But you can really begin with just a normal A4 piece of paper and you are using this as a rough visualisation of what your poster will look like. Now there's no need to go into great amounts of detail with this, with this storyboard, but it's there to help you visualise dimensions, where you want to place things, where information may go, where some visuals may go, and it's your guide to put your ideas down on paper to help you then transform that into a digital poster or print off for publishing online. And this leads on nicely to think about the layout. Now, as you can see on this example, and this is a example storyboard from the conference workshop I recently facilitated, but layout is really, really important. People can get a little bit scared about white space on a poster, but we know that that white space is really important to help people digest the information that you are presenting. So let your poster breathe. Do not overload it. Less is more after all. I also found it useful to think of some invisible grids on my poster to help keep things aligned to provide that clean and professional look. You also want to be guiding your reader through your poster, taking them on that journey from the issue, from the background to the take on messages. 
a people's natural tendency is to read from left to right and then top to bottom. And so that might be useful for you to think about when designing your poster. You could put your key take on messages at the top of the poster. It's up to you really, and there's no right or wrong way to do this. But it's worthwhile thinking about why you are developing your poster and for which audience, and that could help you to design your layout. And thinking about proportions and sizes. The proportions of each section of your poster will very much depend on why you are developing that poster and for the audience to which you're presenting it to. In general though, the results and the conclusions, those key take home messages, are the key sections of any poster. And so they may have more space from the poster. However, if you're developing a poster just to give information about a condition or a specific topic, then the background and the methods may be more appropriate. Always tailor your poster to your audience and to the events within which you are presenting your poster. Next, we want to think about the fonts, more of the design elements of the poster. And so, it goes without saying that the largest possible fonts are the best ones to use. And as a rule of thumb, point 30 is visible from about 1.8 metres away. So we want to be thinking about people stood in front of the poster so that they can be able to read the poster without having to come up too close. Now you may think that talking about fonts is irrelevant, but actually a good or bad font can really make or break a poster. So my key messages are for you to be consistent, use the same font, make people feel that they can relate to your poster. Often you can use two different fonts, two complementary fonts, and this may be one for the headers, the titles, and then one for the body of the text. But I'd suggest that you avoid using word art. You want your poster to look professional and to look clean. Now, there are two examples of fonts on the right, a good example at the top and a bad one at the bottom. And you can see that while that font at the bottom may be relevant for a certain publication, but for a poster, it's not the kind of font we want to be using. They're thinking about colours. People are often afraid of using colour, but please do not be afraid of using a background colour for your poster, or for coloured text boxes behind text. Colour can help to attract people to your poster. After all, in a conference hall with thousands of posters, whose is going to stand out? This is the mindset that you need to be thinking in. But it's important to remember that if we do use colour, that the font colour must contrast highly with the background. And you may want to be considering people who may not be able to distinguish between colours, as well as those who have dyslexia. And so an example though, is to provide white backgrounds but to use a light background that isn't pure white. It's also important to think about subconscious messaging. Now this may not apply to your situation, but if we think about the use of colours, certain colours can trigger emotional responses. For example, red often relates to blood and can induce anxiety. Whereas the likes of blue and green often convey relaxation and trust. When we begin to think about visuals on the poster, it's really important to remember that visuals should enhance the message of the poster. So it's advisable not to fill your poster, your white spaces, with meaningless photographs, graphs and icons if they do not add to the message. If you're going to use photographs and images, then it's really important that you get a good quality image that isn't pixelated, as you can see in this example, with the correct permissions. Now, there are lots of different websites where you can access copyright-free photographs, one example being Pexels. If you're including people, you need to make sure that you've got the correct permissions. Now, this may seem obvious to many, but it's important to get this right. Your poster could be distributed all across the internet, so it's important to remember that you've got everything in order.
as well with the visuals on your poster. It's important that your poster has a consistent feel. So if you are using a particular colour scheme, stick to one or two complementary colours and use those consistently across your background, font colour, figure colours and graphics. As we move forward and you've developed your poster draft, what should you do next? Now a common mistake will be to send your poster directly to print and it arrives in the post and you look and there is a big typing error. Not only is this inconvenient, but it's also costly to try to avoid doing this. If I was you, and what I do is first send my poster to a colleague. Now this could be somebody you work with, or actually giving it to your mum, your dad, your partner, your children. It's a really good way to look for those issues which you may overlook. And they are often typing mistakes, grammatical errors, things in the wrong place. I also like to print out my poster on A4 and get my red pen and look for easy mistakes. In doing this review process, I can actually look for mistakes, but also look at better ways of presenting my poster. Once you've got all that feedback, make your next draft and prepare your final poster. And usually you will save this as a PDF so that it is accessible across different platforms. And now you need to find a printing service to print your poster. There are lots of printers around. Organisations may have existing relationships with a printer, but also there are lots of online organisations which you can easily search for to get your poster printed at reasonable cost. As you're getting your poster printed, you may need to think about different paper types, such as gloss, matte, laminated, and fabric. Now, fabric is a really interesting approach to get your poster printed on. Traditionally, posters come in a large cardboard or plastic tube, and this can be difficult to transport, particularly if you are going abroad. So fabric is increasingly being used as a more convenient option, and the quality looks very good and the poster can simply be folded up into your bag and stored easily. Now that we've covered the concepts of designing your poster, it's time to touch on some different programs and software that you can use to design your poster. Now people often ask me, what is the best piece of software to design a poster? And there really is no right or wrong answer. What's important is that you find something that works for you something which is accessible, convenient and which you feel familiar with. A few examples are shown on screen. The Microsoft PowerPoint is frequently used by academics and researchers to design posters. It's a popular program which many people are familiar with. The tools are user friendly and it's accessible both on Mac and PC. Now there can be challenges with PowerPoint if you're not in an organisation that has licences for Microsoft Office, then it can be costly for individuals to use this programme. For Mac users, Pages will be a familiar option. Pages has a user-friendly interface and tools which people are familiar with if they are a Mac user. But again, this is a downside because it is only available to people with Macs. Another newer option is an online program called Canva. Now Canva is a user-friendly interface with a variety of different tools. You can access it across multiple different platforms, whether that be on computer, tablet or mobile. There are online storage options. There are lots of different templates available and there are free options. However, the tools within the software are limited on the free package so you need to pay for the upgrade to access all of the features and it does require internet access so these are things to think about and I've included a couple of other examples at the bottom such as Adobe InDesign, Adobe Illustrator and Scribus. There are tons and tons of options available and different people will use different software that doesn't mean one is better than the other 
but it's about finding something which works for you. Now that we've got your poster and it's ready to be presented, now is the time to showcase your work. And so I'm going to leave you with some top tips to presenting. Poster sessions, whether that be at a conference or at another event, are great places for networking. They're the places where you can have those discussions about a project. You can bring people into your conversation. So at such events, it's great to take business cards or other information leaflets about you or your organisation with you and don't forget to hand them out. It's really important that you know your poster. You only have a really small amount of time to engage people. You know what it's like at a meeting. People are dashing by and you need to grab their attention. So keep it concise, but keep it informative. And don't forget to emphasise your key messages. And it can be useful to prepare a few points from your poster on paper or on your phone so you've got access to those and rehearse them. Finally, it might be an idea to provide a handout of your poster or a QR code on your poster so that people can access it after they walk away. Paper copies are great for people to look at there and then, but QR codes are increasingly being used so that people can scan the QR code and receive the PDF instantly. People also take photographs of posters as well. Don't forget to advertise your poster at such events on social media. This is a great way to get people's attention either before or during a meeting, but also to widen that reach so that people around the world can see your work and can engage in discussion, because that's what it's all about, sharing your message, sharing your work with as many people as possible. That brings the end of this webinar on designing and presenting a poster. I hope you found the contents of today's webinar useful. There are a range of resources on my website, such as poster templates and tips and tricks as to what to do when designing and presenting a poster. And you can find those at www.simonstones.com.